Have you checked the children? <laughs> days and pleasant nights fellow travelers along the path of beam i am known on this level of the tower as jaime in fuego and if you please you join me here for a bit of palaver on hail to stephen king it's reezy peeps and uh, obviously bevanitos and welcome to the horror show and uh, yes this is the uh el rey uh just celebration that i do every tower tuesday and uh just very stoked to be forging forward with the second part of the 1980s stephen king Dollar Babies, and uh, I was brought attention to these by a awesome film festival. It was called Stephen King Rules that happened back in April, I believe it was, and it was a showcase of a bunch of modern versions of these Dollar Babies adaptations. And so, for anybody who did not see the previous installment, where I talked about those that were the the first three, which were officially released on uh, uh, video, <laughs> VHS tape actually, which were The Woman in the Room, also Disciples of the Crow that was based on Children of the Corn, and then also Boogeyman. So those all saw a physical release, and then the rest of these, which we are going to be covering today, are a little more elusive and uh, can be found on the internet, but if you're here, you will be able to watch them uh, after I give some brief introduction introductions and uh, you'll be able to watch them all as opposed to having to you know sort through torrents and YouTube and all these other places so uh, for the uninitiated the dollar baby program that Cy King has been doing for decades at this particular point and still does to this day. You can find a list of the available uh, shorts because they're all shorts. Those bigger books are all tangled up in rights with, you know, bigger studios and stuff like that. But the Dollar Baby program is where King essentially allows you to option, if you are a uh, student or an amateur filmmaker, the rights to adapt one of his shorter properties if it's not already been optioned by a bigger studio for a buckaroo. Yeah. Single doll hair, man. It's very generous and uh, just, it says so much about, uh, you know, uh, Steve's character in my estimation and just the fact that despite all of his success and as we know the millions upon millions he has made, he is still very much about his philanthropy. And so, as I said in the previous episode, we covered the first three that were uh, done by these amateur filmmakers and now we are going to be talking about the four others that came in the 80s, starting with a Russian animated adaptation of the story Battleground. And so this one was originally published in September of 1972 in Cavalier, which was, yeah, when Psy King was essentially, um, yeah, he was writing uh, and publishing short stories of the horrific variety in these kind of uh, nudie magazines of sorts. And uh, it was later collected in 1978's Night Shift. But this is one that uh, it was done professionally in the 2000s, I, I believe. Uh, I can't remember the year specific, but there was a TNT series which was called Nightmares and Dreamscapes. And yet it wasn't only from that collection that they were adapting things. You know, they kind of they, they kind of cherry picked from all of Steve's uh, short collections and stuff like that. But uh, they did an adaptation with William Hurt. I want to say if I remember correctly. I just want to double check my notes. Yeah, and it was directed by none other than Jim Henson's son Brian, and it. <laughs> It entailed the silliness that I have always found this story to be. Um, it's about this professional hitman who goes and kills this toy maker guy and steals some stuff and uh, it turns into... Uh, yeah, there's like sentient, just self-aware, living toys. It's almost like that Small Soldiers movie, if you guys ever saw that. Or, uh, I, I, boy, I even think uh, there was a Tales from the Hood sketch. I'm trying to remember what, which, which one of the three it was from. But in any event, inconsequential. In 1986, the fourth dollar baby, uh, it, Shra... Uh, Srazheny? I don't know. I I definitely don't uh, you know speak of the Russian, but uh, yeah. So it basically translates in English to the battle, and that's what you guys are about to see right now. And it's an animated form, so give it a scope.
Hello, Johnny. This is Kelvin Bates. Hello, Johnny. Это Келвин Бейтс. Для тебя есть работенка. Один из наших хочет получить больше всех в деле. Жаль, но придется с ним кончать. Платим, как обычно. До встречи. Ганс Морис, президент фирмы игрушек. 46-я улица. Оружие при себе не носит. Детские игрушки компании Морриса. Сундучок для солдат удачи.
Ты окружен. Сдавайся. в этом наборе действующая модель термоядерного устройства Interesting, right? Yeah, I personally prefer this adaptation leaps and bounds above the one with William Hurt that was done live action. I think the the animation, which is brilliant in this, by the way, very, very impressive by, um, oh boy, I thought I had written the director's name down, Derpy's Fuego Derpy. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, what an impressive job from a visual standpoint. And I... I think the animation just kind of pulls back the silly factor of this and makes it a little bit more believable of these weird little soldiers and, and they're, they're adorbs, right? They're cute, as are the little helicopters attacking them and whatnot and the rockets and everything. But yeah, it just pulls back the camp factor, I think, a little bit. And plus the score, like those horns in this, man, I mean, it's very much of the mid 80s, but I think that's why I really dig this adaptation so much. It's very professionally produced and pretty impressive. It's it's up there with with like Woman in the Room, in my estimation, as the, the most accomplished of the 1980s dollar babies. And so now we're jumping into the next one, which in 1987, the following year, there were two that were released and uh, just shown and uh, just uh, showcased, I, I guess is a better, better term, from these amateur student filmmakers. And I think they were both student filmmakers, if I recall correctly. But the, the last rung on the ladder, which uh, appeared for the first time in Night Shift, so it wasn't a previously published sort of situation, but uh, this is another one that has been adapted a few quite a few other times if I'm not mistaken and I think it is still available on the Psyking website for the available dollar babies but that this is the best that I have seen despite the fact that you know like better cameras and modern technology and everything else has given a little bit more sheen and gloss and stuff I these are some of the best performances that I have seen in adapting this uh, James Cole and uh, Dan Thron, I think we're, we're the co-directors on this, and you know, a bunch of kids. But uh, how about I stop talking right now and just get to the awesome score and the great kid performances here in the 1987 version of The Last Rung on the Ladder.
What do you want now? Want to go down to Warner's Pond and go fishing? First, you have to get past Mr. Warner. Mm-hmm. How about we go no, up? No, look. Go inside and play with your stupid dollhouse. You broke it. Did not. Did too. 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 Did too. Okay. You brave enough to play Geronimo? No way. You chicken. And not. Besides, what if the ladder broke? Like I said, you chicken. Anyway, what if Dad came home and he found us there? We'd really get it. He's over at Miss Abigail's. Mom's the baker. They won't be home for hours. They'll never know unless somebody tells you. I wouldn't do that. Are you sure it's safe? Yep. Wait, yep. Scary. Scary, go first. Girls go before boys. <laughs> it's dangerous. One more turn each, and then we gotta get cleaned up, okay? Yep.
Mary? Are you okay? <laughs> You're on my foot. <laughs> Sorry. Did you know what I was doing? No, I had my eyes shut the whole time. Kitty, how could you just do Larry, that? Larry, come on, let's go. Good luck. Thanks. We're going to the woodshed now, Larry. I think you know what's going to happen to you there. Okay. And yeah, I don't know, and you know, then what a short, very emotional, obviously. I don't know if it conveys as much emotion as the short story, at least as far as the, the sadness of the loss of the sibling, as you just saw, and you know, and like reading the newspaper clippings and, and everything. But this is such a sad, somber tale, but also has that sweetness uh, as far as just the the love between siblings and I mean, as somebody who had two younger brothers and we got ourselves in a lot of shit a lot of the time, I took the blame all too often for the bad ideas of my little bros. Dad. But I mean, to be fair, we all had them. We got into our fair share of, of mischief and, and whatnot. But I, that that piano uh, little bit, which uh, they did an interview actually when they showed this at the Stephen King Rules Festival. And uh, yeah, he was uh, the, the director who they interviewed, one of the directors obviously, was saying that they just booked some studio time and that was like a one take sort of situation from uh, yeah, a friend of his who, I, I believe it was a, a she, a, a lady, a, a young lady, and she just sat down and just knocked it out. She was that proficient of a pianist and just did such an impressive job. And that, once again, this along with our, our previous, uh, you know, viewing of, of the battle, these are some of the best uh, that all of these 80s, even back to the ones that I covered on the previous installment, seen a lot of uh, very subpar Dollar Baby adaptations, unfortunately, and yet this is one that I think is really impressive as well, uh, especially from the performances out of these young actors and uh, just the, the chemistry that they had, and it's it's really, really cool. I think if you go over to the, uh, the Stephen King Rules Twitter, uh, you can find links to the interview that they did with the director of this, and he's he's still very proud of it, and as he should be, I think, for for something done so young, that uh, this is a uh, this is a landmark accomplishment for sure. And so we get in now to the other from 1987. And that's The Lawnmower Man. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Pierce Brosnan film that we got in the 90s that uh, King got so pissed off that he actually uh, was like, nah man, you better take my name off because this is nothing to do with the short story that originated actually in, uh, uh, surprise, surprise, Cavalier, 1975, and then was also collected in Night Shift, if I recall correctly. But um, yeah, man, this is a story I've never been that fond of, to be fair. There's also a uh, comic book adaptation in the 1980s that, that Marvel did, which is very faithful to the story compared to King having to sue in the 90s over that, that aforementioned film that dealt with the, you know, 3D and virtual reality. 
all that sort of silliness. But um, yeah, man, um, let's just uh, jump right into it, as they like to say here on the uh, on the YouTubies. And just it, it, this is maybe the most amateur, the most pedestrian. But uh, yes, uh, let's let's talk about uh, thoughts uh, here in a moment after watching it. Shasta spent a hard night in a Cousinart. Honey, I'm in the on deck circle and I'm ready to come up to the plate. Wake up. Not until you get rid of that moa. Jeez, hon, it's been a week for Christ's sakes. Every time I see it, I think of poor Mrs. Smith and her cat. Good night, Harold. God. Give me strength. Fair enough trade, huh, good buddy? Yeah, right, good buddy. Two stinking tires and a tank of gas for a $200 lawn master. Looked again, old buddy. <laughs> but I need my lawn mowed. He's in college. You sure? Yeah, I know you're his mother, but... All right. All right. Goodbye. Seven six two three nine zero. All right. Damn straight. Karis. Karis. What the hell kind of name is that? Crow. Greek. 
Who the hell cares as long as he cuts the damn grass? Sort of a new thing the boss been working on. Uh, of course, every now and then we run into a customer who don't understand. Some people got no respect for uh, efficiency, right, buddy? But the boss is always agreeable to a sacrifice. Sort of keeps the wheels greased, if you know what I mean. Oh, sure. I mean, well, God bless the grass. <laughs> oh! God bless the grass. Oh, that's a good one. Damn good. Oh, I can see you got the right spirit. Uh, I'm going to write that sucker down. Meantime, duty calls. Huh? Oh, sure. Whatever you say. I, uh, I'm just going to finish my nap. You go right ahead, good buddy. This hits everybody harder first, but, but you'll get used to it. Right. Let's see, the police or the mental hospital? You might want to give it a whirl yourself, good buddy. Boss always has an eye out for our new talent. The boss? Well, say, buddy, I figured you must have guessed. God bless the grass and all. Hands the boss. Yeah. I'd like to report it. Well, uh... I'd like to report a case of indecent exposure. There's a naked man mowing my lawn. What? What is can I see his genitals? What kind of a sick question is that? Of course I can see. God, come! Show me where you eat this 
sharp as butcher knives. To get this sacrifice business out of the way fast enough. Cuts, you might say. Sex maniac. Must have been. Bannerman, this world is full of nuts. Never forget that. Yes, sir. Hell of a nice looking lawn, though. Wish I could get mine to look this nice. Yes, it's uh, supremely low punch, obviously. Not like, you know, The Last Rung in the Ladder or, uh, you know, some of the others had like the biggest budget or anything, you know, and uh, I can only imagine how much it costs to produce that animation for the battle. But this is, uh, it, yeah, yeah, New York film student. And uh, it, it's still an amusing performance to me from this asshole just sitting around listening to the, the score. You guys know this Take Me Out to the Ball Game was, was the score. And uh, yes, he's mad that kids in college and can't mow his lawn and it's growing to grotesque proportions and so much so that the little girl is hiding in it, you know, from not wanting to eat the, eat the Brussels sprouts and stuff. But this is a faithful adaptation of a Psy King story that I can't say I'm the biggest fan of, but nonetheless, it's, um, it's entertaining to a point in its weird shock gross out factor of, uh, you know, the, the big old Gordo dude just, you know, crawling around on all fours, buck ass naked and eating the shavings from the grass and just being totally strange. But God bless the grass, right? Isn't that, uh, isn't that the thing? And I, I do, I, I am amused at the fact that we shift from the absurd to some justification in uh, both this and the short story and the Marvel comic adaptation in the fact that, yeah, there is a horror sort of twist as opposed to just being darkly comedic, the sacrificial aspect. So um, yeah, this one was uh, directed by uh, Jim Goris, uh, it looks like. And uh, yeah, I, I do like the little Easter egg of at the end mentioning uh, Bannerman when he was seemingly like a, like a lieutenant or a deputy or something as opposed to being the sheriff that would go on to be uh, killed by Cujo. So let's get now into, the, oh, you know what? Before I forget, there was actually in 1988, a uh, somebody who was supposed to make a dollar baby uh, by the name of Guy Madden, who went on to be a very prolific Canadian filmmaker and he did lectures at Harvard so much so because he had become so influential. I looked at his IMDB and a lot of stuff that he had worked on and there were not, and I, I'm assuming he's just incredibly prolific in the Great White North as opposed to uh, knowledgeable within a lot of American audiences. Um, I know he had a silent film slant uh, that he was really into and stuff, but early in his career in 1988, yeah, he was supposed to be producing an adaptation of Here There Be Tigers, which uh, I'm trying to remember if that one was collected in Skeleton Crew or if it was uh, the Night Shift, but uh, nonetheless, um, yes, uh, it uh, never 
never was produced, unfortunately. And that is one that has gone on to be made countless times. It's about this one. It was like a third grader or basically grade school student who needs to go use the bathroom and he's then teased and all this other stuff goes in there and there's a tiger in there and he spends too much time so uh, the the bully goes in and it's like yo you got to get back to class and he ends up just sending kid in to get eaten by the tiger it's a it's a fine story it's uh, one of the oldest ones I think that King ever wrote and uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of great adaptations floating around on the interwebs if you can track them down. But uh, yeah, Guy Madden was supposed to make this in 88, but ironically, it was never produced. And that brings us to the final uh, uh, showcase here. And this is one that I'm not 100% how much I'm going to be able to show, unfortunately. I know that uh, you guys just got done watching the other couple of installments, most notably the first three. but. This one, which was produced by an Oklahoma college student in 1989, adapting Kane Rose Up. Uh, what is the name of the director? Uh, David C. Spillers. And you know what? It's pretty damn good. I actually like this a lot more than I, I've seen Kane Rose Up because it's uh, it, it's very similar to Rage, uh, and uh, also also maybe even more so to uh, Apt Pupil as far as the end game of what transpires, but. Uh, it deals with uh, school shooting sort of situation, and it's one that uh, King wrote back in 68, had it published in uh, Ubris, which was actually the uh, the school literary magazine, I believe, if I remember correctly, from uh, reading Hearts in Suspension, the nonfiction about King's time at the University of Maine. But uh, yeah, this one has been done countless times, and it's a timely theme, but I've always had a little bit of an issue with it because similar to Rage, I feel like it glorifies the decision of this person, but it's also very amusing with the talking about Cain and Abel stuff and uh, talking to Humphrey Bogart and his poster on his wall. But uh, as, well, we'll see how much I can showcase, but this is probably gonna be heavily edited because of the fact that there is uh, a ton of use of Megadeth in this. Most notably, the opening credits, which I'm definitely going to have to silence. They use P-Cells, that awesome bass line by Dave Ellison, who has himself in some hot water right now for some dumb shit that he did and just got fired from Megadeth. But yeah, it's, it's using that awesomely catchy bass line and introduction to the song for the opening credits. And so obviously you're not going to be able to listen to that. So I'm, I'm going to pick and choose to show as much of this as I can. You also get some In My Darkest Hour, the ballad from uh, the, the follow-up record to, to Peace Cells. And um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's still very well done. So you will see as much as I can show. And uh, yes, I just give thoughts, I guess, in comments below and stuff about performance and whatnot. But let's see how much of this I can actually squeeze up. That was a bummer, wasn't it? That was truly a bummer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was tough. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna drop that class in January, but time passed before I knew it. I think I flunked it, I just know I did. Yeah, I wanted a couple from you, but Willard, man, he has these eyes like an eagle. 
Left break. You think you got your AR? Guess I flunked. You flunked? No way. You could. Look, man, I'm gonna take a shower, all right? Okay. Was that your last test? Yes, it was. Hey, Kurt! Kurt! Yeah. You all done, man? Yeah. Well, don't forget to sweep up and uh, turn in your damage report. Okay, okay if I'm not in my room, just kind of you know, slip it on the door, okay? Okay. Hey, hey, you have a good summer, man. You don't work too hard. Okay. Use it, but don't abuse it. You know what I mean? I will. Take care, man. Okay. I won't. Damn sport! Man. Hey, Kurt! Oh, man. Hey, uh, how's chem final? All right. Anyway. Oh, hey, cut bar your notes. I tossed them out. Downstairs? Yeah. Well, I, I could probably still find them. Uh, they're probably down there somewhere. <clears throat> hey. You think, uh, think that you would mind if I borrowed this? I doubt it. Man. That poster of Bogart's boss. I mean, no bare flesh, but hey, you know. I don't suppose you're gonna toss it out. I was gonna take a shower. Oh, well, okay, cool. Hey, you have a good summer. Thanks. Hey, uh, get another 4.0 this semester? At least. <laughs> good deal. I'll see you next year. Hey. Let me tell you something. God got mad at Cain because Cain had an idea God was a vegetarian. But his brother knew better. God made the world in his image. When you eat the world, the world will eat you. So Cain says to his brother, why didn't you tell me? And his brother says, why didn't you listen? So Cain says, I'm listening now. So his brother slices him into pieces and says to God, you want meat? Here it is. You want roast or ribs or able burgers or what? So God told him to put on his dancing shoes. So, what do you think? Hey, Curtis Bailey. Hey, listen, man, I'll give you half a rock for that Bogart poster. Kurt? Kurt! Hell. There's the men again. Good drink, good meat, good God, let's eat. <laughs> Eat the world, piggy. Come on, man. He's shot. They're shooting shoot him. Stop. He killed himself. I know it. Hey, oh, come it. on. Kill Bailey. I off. couldn't get in there and think. I was banging on his door. Hold on to this. Fine, then hurry up. All right, see, now just 
Oh, come on, can't you open the key or something? Garish, open I don't have the key. Garish! Hey, I'm Garish! Just stuff. I just know it! Garish, open up! I'm just worried. I, I mean, hey, it's not like we make that much monetization-wise from a lot of these videos, you know, especially, I mean, we have in some cases, which is really cool, but there's been other cases where uh, when I'm covering more obscure topics like this, I mean, who knows where it's going to go, and uh, I, I just don't want the video to get pulled down and have to re-upload and re-edit and all of that, so uh, you probably, uh, since I'm filming this before, I see if I need to trim this down or not. Sorry for those bits of quietness in, to, in the, the viewing process, but I will put a link in the, the description box below for you to watch this properly. But yeah, it's very, it's very late 80s, you know, metalhead dudes and stuff like that. But uh, I, I think the performances are good from his friend borrowing the notes to just the, the caginess of, uh, of Garish and stuff. And uh, yeah, I, and I, I don't know. I always think that it is cool when somebody can follow through and do something like this. And being a big fan of Megadeth, you know, uh, dude had good taste in music, especially at the time. So, yeah, everybody, hail contact and to any constant viewers and readers that are stumbling upon this, that is the breakdown of the second half of the 1980s Stephen King dollar babies. I hope you enjoyed these if you had seen them before and are revisiting them, or if I got to uh, just make you aware of that, it is my humble uh, and very honored uh, just privilege to, you know, be able to share this palaver with all of you. I have been Jaime Fuego, and you can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on the YouTubies, and uh, yeah, if uh, you are inclined to have further palaver uh, and you're willing to jump onto the fake book, we do have a Facebook group called Hail to Stephen King, just like the title of this series of videos I've been doing for over four years now, and uh, terrific palaver, over a thousand peeps there, great calf amongst everybody, great palaver and discussion, and uh, every Friday we do something called Freak Out Fridays, which is where we let you discuss anything else, as long as it is respectful, aside from King and his clan, which includes Joe and Owen and Tabby and so on and so forth. And uh, yes, next Tuesday, next Tower Tuesday, July 6th, I believe is the specific day, we will be shifting to a live version of this show for the book of the month, which is none other than Cujo for its 45th anniversary. My God, I can't, or excuse me, 35th anniversary. Come on, Fuego, get it together, man. Yeah, 35 years since that book came out. That is just kind of racy. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to the revisit, however, or actually, no, it's the 40th anniversary. Good Lord, dude. Uh, all of the dates and, uh, you know, uh, anniversaries and stuff that I cover on this, they're, they're all running together, but 40 years of Cujo. That is just nutsoid, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the, the revisit and uh, having that live discussion with all of you. So, I've been Fuego. Y'all have been Rad Status, as per always, and until the reel of Ka comes around once more, Hasta luego, San Amigos, constant readers and viewers alike. Say thank you. I hope we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, remember to stay scared and read Stephen King.